Hi everybody. So um, in this video, we're going to talk about a really nice little little uh, part called the uh, put it in here the the TT Go T call, which you can also see on the web page here. Now, what this is is an Espressif ESP32 part microcontroller, which is on the uh, silver bit on the right hand side there, and. TT Go do a range of different boards for all sorts of different purposes. Um, you, you can find them all over the place and very well priced. And um, this one, this this T call is for cellular communications. So this particular one has a Simco uh, Sim 800L modem on it, and that little black thing there is the uh, the GSM antenna. So what that's going to enable us to do is to uh, do data communications, hey, phone calls too actually if you wanted to, over the 2G network which is, is quite old now, you know we've had 2G, 3G, 4G, now we've got 5G, uh, but 2G is still sort of hanging around for a while although um, it will be shut down at some point in the future. So we can, um, we can have a bit of a look at starting off on how to do low cost cellular data communications with the TTGO TCOL. You can see on the web page here, um, Google for it, it's um, specification is 32-bit processor, 240 megahertz, usual bits and bobs, with UARTs, interfaces, and it's, um, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got Bluetooth, and it's got this cellular modem connected to it as well. Uh, you can also, which is kind of kind of nice, you can plug in on the back, there's a little connected down at the back there you can power from a rechargeable battery too so you can sort of put this thing into a sleep mode wake up do some stuff go back to sleep quite nice um, so if you look at the previous videos we've got how to go about installing Ubuntu virtual machines we've got how to go about installing uh, platform IO which is my IDE of choice for these kinds of things you can also use the Arduino IDE and we've got some videos on, on how to go about using Arduino uh, for, for other purposes as a cheer lights video that I did but for this my preference is platform IO so we're gonna we're gonna stick with that so if I run up um, virtual machine this is virtual box uh, again go to the other videos to look at how we got all this set up and um, we're gonna power this machine on up it runs good I'm gonna log in and we're up and running now you might have seen in previous videos when I tried to I'm having some sort of display problems because it's quite a high resolution display here and so I'm kind of having to sort of you know bring up the size of uh, the the icons and the text on this virtual machine so I can actually see something when I was trying to make this a window bigger before um, it wasn't working and the reason for that I discovered is that we uh, we can change the display uh, video memory. There wasn't enough video memory, which is why it was blacking out. So I've changed that up to um, 128 meg now, so we can on a nice big screen so that we can see what's going on. I'll make myself a little bit smaller if I can over there. Cool. So let's um, let's run up VS Code. We've already installed the platform IO extension, so that's there. And um, yeah, I don't want to do color themes. I don't want to do that stuff. So let's open up PIO Home. And what I want to do is to open a project. Now, yeah, here we go. What I what I actually want to do is to get clone some project work that I've already got. Um, and so down here in the miscellaneous we can git clone project for ourselves um, what we're going to use is if I pull up the browser I've been working on some of this sort of cellular comms for some uh, commercial work and I've got the beginnings of a sort of test test utility test program that we can pull in and start to play with rather than having to start from scratch so if we, um, this uh, Firefox always seems to take an age to load up, I'm still waiting for it. Ah, let's 
try that again. Oh, there we go. Took an age. So if we go to GitHub, Dynamic Devices. This is where I tend to put a lot of work. And the uh, repository that we're interested in here is current called TTGO Tickle Platform IO. Um, I won't go into the ins and outs of GitHub and how that works for our purposes. It's a, an SCM tool, Software Configuration Management. We can store versions of our software as we change it and build it and do things with it. So if we go to the code button here for Git clone to build, take a copy of this code, uh, we've got a couple of options, HTTPS and there's another one. So copy the, the link to do a Git clone. And then we go back to trying to clone the Git project, which should be coming up with something, but isn't. Let's try again. So what I just noticed was that when I tried to Git clone my project, I'm actually getting nothing happening. It's not telling me why either. Now there's a, a, a Git source control button on the left hand side which is kind of giving the game away because it's telling me that um, I don't have Git installed. I should probably have done that as one of the basic things that we need when we're installing Ubuntu. So let's get that installed. We're going to do our sudo apt install git. There we go. Down it comes. We've now got the git command. And what we do is we're going to reset the uh, reload Visual Studio. And see, that's changed now. So it's found Git. If I do um, on Git project, now we're getting that popping up. So I just need to go back and um, find that URL because I just reset while I was figuring this out. And uh, we've got a GitHub dynamic. I says and go to the call get that URL for the HTTPS and we're going to put that in there you can actually go into um, oh, maybe I didn't copy it copy, copy, paste good, you can actually go and clone into GitHub, you can log into GitHub and clone using a different plugin which is kind of nice but we're not going to worry about that uh, so I think I'll create a folder here to put all this stuff in called projects and we'll use that as our repository uh, do I want to open the clone repository well yes please I think that'll be quite good do I trust the authors well I, I wrote this stuff so you know you can make your own decision on that but I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust these guys um, and there we go so we've now got um, a, a platform IO project opened up within platform IO within Visual Studio Code and um, there's a few different bits and pieces to, to go through here so we'll sort of whiz through I guess um, on the left hand side we've got a bunch of different options we're in the Explorer tab at the minute we sort of bring that in and out then there's a search there's a source control um, debugging which we're not going to look at today extensions you see we've already installed the platform IO extension haven't we and then the platform IO extension itself. The two main things that we're going to go backwards and forwards between our platform IO and the Explorer view. So the Explorer view is telling us all the files that we have in our project. Files that begin with a dot tend to be, or folders that begin with a dot tend to be generated. So they're sort of intermediary things that we don't really necessarily have to worry about. Um, and we've got some board configuration for our TT call because <coughs> at the minute platform IO doesn't have out-of-the-box support for it don't need to worry about that um, include files library files source files and our main source file here is an MQTT client file that's what we're going to be mainly running with and then uh, some test some other bits and pieces the core of it all is what's called the platform .ini file and that defines the project for platform IO and as you make changes to this that changes behaviors of platform IO do a quick run through a couple of things we care about these blocks in here define the environment that we're running within this is our base environment that's all the sort of the very basic bits and pieces um, we select a monitor speed some options uh, some information for the board and some dependencies 
Um, this this chip that we have, this board that we have connected with USB, that's going to pop up as a device on the virtual machine, and we um, we can program over that device. So that's uploading. Um, we can monitor over that device. That's what the program is printing out. So the monitor speed is how fast that serial port's running at, and the monitor port is what we're sitting on monitoring. You see monitor port definition there, and upload port is what we're programming over. If you don't set an upload port, Platform IO will try and find it, um, but for my purposes, I'm just setting that explicitly, and if that's wrong, because maybe it's you know, you've got a couple of different things plugged into your system, you would change that to USB 1 or whatever it might be. Um, more specifically, we've got an environment for this T call that I'm using, and we've got a separate one for a different Tony S3 chip that I work with that we're not going to look at today. So forget about all of that. This environment that extends this basic setup and it uses the Espressive 32 platform. And all that's saying is that the, the chip on this thing is an ESP32 from Espressive. So we use the platform from them to do our builds. And then it uses an Arduino framework, which adds some um, support code on top of that basic platform so that we can do Arduino-like things. Because um, if you've used the Arduino ID, it works slightly differently to a bog standard C, C++ compiler. It does a little bit of pre-parsing. Um, in fact, if we look at the file that we're using for our main file, that's an INO file, which is a little bit odd to C programmers because we would expect a .c or a .cp. P. Um, the INO indicates it's an Arduino file and that there is a little bit of this pre-parsing that goes on, which is supported because that's what we've set in platform.io. Again, it's a bit of background. You don't, you know, you don't need to worry about this so much, but it sort of informs you as to why things are the way they are. So um, the board name and then some build flags that we use to set things up for the uh, for the program to run. So that should all work out of the box, hopefully. Then what we do is we go and um, I think probably we'll just try and do a build firstly. Oh no, what I wanted to do was I wanted to take you through how platform IO, uh, platform IO .ini sets tasks project tasks so if we go through over to the platform io tab you can see that we've got ttgo tcall and that has um, been generated actually from this scripting in here which is sort of defining all of this stuff so i've got a, a tcall task and a tiny s3 task for those two different boards and within that we've got various items now this is taking quite a while to load up and that's because it's the first time we've done all this stuff and platform IO being quite clever what it's gone is it's gone away and it said oh so I need a I need an Espressive 32 platform I better go and find that and download it it's quite big I need Arduino support I better go and find that and download it so that's what's happening in the background and if we go over to um, for example look at platforms in our PIO home we're now seeing that we've got some Espressive 32 support, which we didn't have in there before. That's automatically been pulled down as a dependency, which is kind of nice. Uh, frameworks, you know, some are doing stuff. I don't know if that's installed yet or it's or it's still going. But if we go back to um, our PIO view, that's still loading. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little bit of a break while that finishes off. It might take another minute or two, and then I'll be back with you. So that's now um, that's now loaded up, and uh, let me just leave that on the top there. So that's now loaded up, and you see a load of different items in here. Now, um, when we do that in future, that's going to be a lot faster. It does occasionally, if you make changes to platform I/O, um, it reloads this and it kind of stops. And if you see that, you just sort of close it off and you open it up again, and it will sort itself out. But it should be a lot faster in future. So if we look through the um, options we have here, we can do a build of the code, we can upload the code, which is programming it to our little target chip. We can monitor the output of what the, the chip, the board is printing as the code runs. Often what we want to do is to upload and then go straight into monitor mode to see what's happening. So that's upload and monitor. And if we want to clean the intermediate build artifacts of the build, that's what we do with clean. Clean all takes everything out, it takes out library dependencies that it builds in that as well. 
Um, the ESP chips are pretty cool. You can have a file system on them and you can put files in that file system. So here's an option to build a local file system image, which you can then program into the board, but we don't do that here. Uh, and then there's a custom script that I've added in, which is my custom script in platform IO, right public key, which is for some crypto stuff I'm working on, which um, is, is outside the scope of this chat, maybe in future. Um, and that's it, that's those tasks. So let's try running one. Let's um, build the software. And hopefully this is gonna do what we want it to do. So you can see that's compiling all the source files to object files. They're going into that .pio sort of intermediate directory I told you about. Um, then it's linking those files against the libraries and libarduino that's in there. And it's telling us a bit of information. It's using some of the RAM and it's using some of the flash. And that's where we are with that. We've now got our firmware image that can be programmed into the board. And uh, we're good to go. Brilliant. Okay, so how are we going to program this stuff into the board? Well, when this connects up, it's connected up with the USB connector uh, I told you about. And that is connecting to the physical machine, not the virtual machine. So we've got to do a little bit of extra work to um, route that through, as it were, so that the virtual machine knows about it. So let's have a look at that. If we look at devices in the virtual machine manager and USB, we can see that there are some, these are sort of all the different USB devices that I've got connected up to the host up top here. And one of them is the Silicon Lab CP2104. I happen to know that that's the chip on the uh, TT Go board, which does the bridging between UART and serial comms. Now, if I didn't know precisely you know, what I was trying to wire up here, what I would do is I'd unplug my board and then I'd see what was there. You can see that's gone now. And then what I would do is I would plug it in. And if we do that, USB-C connector there. And look at that, it's come back. So that tells me you know, what's what. Now, I can check this little checkbox on the side and that will connect the USB device through to the virtual machine. But I would then have to do that every time I connected it. And I, I don't want to have to fiddle about with this. So a nicer way of doing it is to go into USB settings. And then if I click the green plus button, I can choose the device that I want to be attached. And in future, whenever that's plugged in, it will automatically attach it into this running virtual machine. Now if I go back and I look, I see it's not attached yet because having made that change, I need to remove and then reconnect my device. And what I'll see is that that's now connected up to the system. So that's great. So I've got that device. Now I can check that that's worked in a couple of different ways. One is I can go to my platform IO tab and I can look at the uh, devices there. And you see as if by magic that's coming up telling me that that is connected and it's been given the uh, name dev tty usb zero if you had other things connected um, that might change to one or two or three or four and some other kinds of boards have different naming convention like tty acm something like that but for what we're doing with the t call in a virtual machine connecting up one device that's what it's going to be now next thing we want to do is having built our code we want to try to upload our code to our connected device if we click upload, it just kind of goes through and double checks. Um, you know, it's built everything. It's downloading some tools that it needs to actually do the programming. It's trying to do the programming and it's erroring. And it's telling us that that port doesn't exist, which is kind of weird because we, we saw that it said it did exist before. And it's another example of, of, you know, sometimes your messages can be a little bit misleading. And actually the problem is a little bit different. And what the problem is, is if I do a list of that device ls minus l tells me some information and it tells me see that rw and then rw and then just like dashes there what that is is it's to do with the privileges that i have to access the port as the user that i am so those privileges are read and write to root the owner and those privileges are read and write to this dialog group and then normal users we, we don't have any privileges so um, that's why it's telling us that it can't talk to the port and there's a couple of different ways to, to skin this cat, as it were. One is, 
that I can change the permissions of this device using sudo chmod all permissions to be added read write for dev tty usb 0 and that will then change those permissions to you see I've got an extra rw and that gives me access the problem is that if I then remove this device from the system and then I plug it in again it will have removed the device uh, file handle if you like and then replaced it so if I look at it now my permissions have disappeared again that's a real pain um, I don't want to have to keep doing this all the time so you know in typical fashion what do we do we go Google to try to find an answer to this problem Linux user can't access serial port and then if I go and have a look at this there's a load of different people telling you how to fix it one of the ways to fix it is to change my users setup user mod and add my user to the dialout group which is this group that has read write access so that's what I'm going to try and do what's the format user mod minus a minus g dialout let's try and copy that see if I can copy that across I can't can I, can I copy that across it's not working one tip if you are um, running with your virtual box and you want to do cut and paste between host and client go to shared clipboard by directional make my copy and then as if by magic I can paste that into the client so that's quite useful and you can see how useful that could be so I need to put my username in here AJ Lennon and that's going to add me to the uh, to the dialog group and if I type ID I am not in that group yet and that's because I have to log out and log back in for that to take effect so let's just do that if I can bring that down log out turns out what I actually needed to do was to reset or reboot the machine so logging out and back in wasn't enough I've restarted the machine now you can see that if I run the ID command it tells me that I who am I I'm AJ Lennon I'm the member of the dialog user group so that should with a bit of luck give me access to that serial port bit of a pain but you know there we go so I'm gonna restart Visual Studio I'm gonna restart platform IO and if I go to the platform IO button when it pops up and open up so it's populating but it's much faster than the first time wasn't it and now if I do upload it'll go through its checks again it's already built most of it and it's now trying to connect and it's writing the code to the device to to this device Ooh, fantastic we have some uh, progress here so when that's written it's gonna sort of tell me everything was successful and that's fine uh, and it's done and then um, I can't really see what's going on and that's why this upload and monitor thing is is good I could just run monitor now but I'd like you to see this start up from the beginning so I'm gonna redo that I'm gonna re-upload and monitor um, and what you find is that the the programming mode the way this works it uses something called esptool.py which resets the chip into a programming mode and how that works can be different depending on which board you're using so we're quite lucky with the t-core board that it allows us to automatically do this stuff instead of pushing buttons all over the place and now it's running and now you can see some output from the code that's running on the chip through the serial port through the usb and it's telling us that it's initializing that modem it's found the simcom sim 800 l which is fantastic some flashy lights on here too and it's now trying to acquire the network so it's trying to get onto one of the cell towers locally for 2G communication which is really nice so that again you know that can take a while it's sort of very dependent I mean I think the GSM spec is for up to like two or three minutes or something so it could take quite a while in my experience it's normally taken about this long which indeed it did and we've now gone from getting the network to trying to bring up the GPRS connection over that network which is uh, to do with something called a PDP which is like a data context um, that's now trying to connect us up to the PDP through the cell so that we can do data communications again that can take quite a while too it's all very variable and sometimes depending on how busy the cell is um, you know you, you fail to connect and you have to retry so we're going to wait for that to complete 
And that basically sort of gets us to a point like where, you know, you get on your Wi-Fi, you know, your phone is connected to the Wi-Fi in, in the space that you're in. And then we can start to try to do some data communications. Now, um, I like lots of different ways of doing this, but I like a, a protocol called MQTT, which is a pretty lightweight way of doing data communications for uh, IoT devices, for Internet of Things devices. You see that we've uh, actually connected up to the, the PDP there, and now we've brought up um, a, a data socket, a TCP IP, a TCP socket, through to uh, an MQTT broker, which is my broker running at mqtt.dynamicdevices.co.uk. We've connected to that and we've published a message telling that broker that we're online. Absolutely fantastic. And we get a little bit of uh, information on how many bytes we've been transmitting because I'm doing some work on that for low overhead data communications and then uh, free memory. This, so as I say, this is a test program, so it's designed to just run and run and run, and it sends data every now and again, and we can sort of see what's going on with that connection, how reliable it is, how resilient it is. But that gets us to the point where we've used Platform IO with a project to build and write some firmware to a little TTGO board and get onto a cellular connection and send MQTT data over that connection. Fantastic. So I think what we'll do now is we'll just have a run through of what that code is actually doing in you see mqtt.client.ino we were looking at weren't we. So if we go back here and there's bits I'm going to skip over but you know it's all in the repo you can go through this yourself. Um, we got some debugging that we turn on so we can see what's going on with the ESP platform. Um, we don't have to be using this SIM 800 that's on the TT Go board. There are other boards I use with other modems, so you can select that. Um, the the magic sort of secret source, as it were, that we're using is something called Tiny GSM. So props to the people behind Tiny GSM. It's really nice. Um, you know, if we were to go and Google for that, you'll find that online. Um, predominantly, a lot of people use that with Arduino. Um, but as I say, we're sort of pulling that into the platform that IO build. And this supports lots of different kinds of um, modems. So you look in here, you'll see a lot of different models, which is nice. And we're using, as I say, the SIM 800, and you can add in your own if you needed to. Um, so then, you know, we're supporting that modem. One of the things we can do if we're trying to debug what's going on is we can enable AT commands. So um, what I might do is just do a rebuild. There we go. That's rebuilding with that change that I made to uncomment the um, the uh, AT commands. Let's just disappear off the screen, isn't it? Let's bring that back. There we go. Dump AT commands. And with that built, we'll do another upload and monitor. That's programming. And then it will reset and start up. And the difference here now is that you can see as it starts to talk to the modem. So it's sending AT commands. Those are the standard old school way that we all talk to modems. It's called the Hayes AT command set. You can look it up. And it's been extended and extended over the years with new features. But basically we're writing, so here we're writing an AT plus C reg question mark which if you look that up is sort of saying to the modem, hey, are you registered on the network here? And the modem is responding with, with no, I'm not, um, which is the two, until um, it gets to a point where it is registered, and that five, again, if you look it up, means it's registered roaming, which is because of the SIM card I've got in here, and we move on to the next step, and you can see how it's bringing up uh, the, uh, the PDP context and, and getting onto the data network. So trying to debug what's going on underneath with the modem. You can enable that, that's quite useful. Um, these two serial ports I've defined, one of them is for serial monitoring, which is what we're looking at here. The other one is for the serial AT commands, which is the internal port that is like physically wired up to the modem on the board. Then 
couple of other bits and pieces. I've been experimenting with Keep Alive's for TCP that is it's outside the context of, of this uh, this discussion. And then we've got a broker that is what I'm talking to for the MQTT. And then I've got some topics that I talk to the broker on and some payloads for those topic messages. You know, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of how the MQTT protocol works here. But you can see basically that um, when we get into the this is an Arduino-like um, piece of source, as I said to you. So Arduino uses a setup function, which gets called at start. And we're initializing our, our monitoring, waiting a little bit, doing some logging. Uh, this, this we don't need to worry about. And then we loop, and we loop and loop and loop continuously. And what we're saying is, you know, every now and again, we try and do some modem handling. And there's a state machine, a little state machine in here that goes through what we were just looking at, acquiring the network and then um, acquiring the GPRS connection and then acquiring the MQTT connection etc etc and if any of those fails it tries to fall back and retry to build in some resilience. So when we make an MQTT connection if I can find that down here yeah so wait for GPS acquire MQTT and then that's where we're trying to do this, uh, this MQTT connect when that um, runs that function, in we go and we try to make our connection here and QTT connect. And then when we've done that, we publish a message saying, hey, we're alive, we're still here, we're doing our stuff. And then we subscribe to, to another topic um, if there's any messages coming in for us. And after we've done all that stuff, we basically just sort of wait. And then if there is some interesting stuff for us to look at, we get this. MQTT callback function called um, for example if there's a message coming in for us on a topic we've subscribed to and we can interrogate that message and do things currently all we do is we look to see if it's a reset message and if we uh, get that reset message then we, we reset so that's all that's all pretty good um, what I'm gonna do is to go back just for clarity and take out the uh, AT command logging. So let's get rid of that again. And let's rebuild. Now while we're, while we're rebuilding, um, I just want to look at something that I've got going on here. So this is back on my host system. And I can run um, a Mosquito which is a reference implementation of the MQTT broker I've got running uh, that we're talking to. And I can subscribe to that broker. And I'm subscribing on a topic which is anything to do with GSM client test. So I'm going to subscribe to that. And some information comes up. And then if I go back to the code that I'm running here, and I program that back into the uh, board, and we'll get the board to start up. So let's do that. And then what's going to happen is we're going to go through that process again. So we're going to hop onto the network, bring up the GPRS, make the MQTT connection, publish an Live message, subscribe to some commands. And um, if I show you this subscription we were talking about, what should happen, if we're lucky, is that when our ESP32 or T call device publishes that information over cellular, it'll be received at the subscription client that we've got here, which is, is waiting for information on this particular GSM client test topic. So it all takes a little bit of a while. We're just going to have to bear with. You see why I took the AT commands out so that it was a bit more clear what was happening as it was happening. So we're still waiting for that network to be acquired. Should be any time now, I would hope. You see sometimes it takes longer, sometimes it's quite quick. It's all very much dependent. There we go. Oh, I'm still waiting. Well, I don't want to bore you with this, so I'm going to 
pause just until it's acquired the network and then we'll continue. There you go. So it took us about 100 seconds and we've acquired the network. We're now trying to bring up that GPRS connection. That was quite fast, got that. And we've now connected and published to the broker. And you can see that we published on this number, which is our IMEI number for the, for the modem device ending 778. And we've just had a message published 778 online, which is in fact all we published. Isn't that lovely? Now what I can do is I can uh, publish a message from somewhere else. So in this case, my laptop using this mosquito pub command. I'm going to publish this to the MQTT broker. And I'm going to publish it on uh, a similar topic to GSM client test. Uh, but this is called CMND. And if you remember, we subscribed to um, CMND earlier on. If I can just find that for you. This is the topic command fragment that we subscribe to which is CMND sort of appended to the end of the, the full topic. So if I um, send a message to that saying hi there what will now happen is that will be published to the broker in the cloud and the broker has a subscription over the cellular link to this TT Go board so it's going to send it over the cellular and it should be received down on the board um, so we receive it ourselves because we have a subscription and it's now arrived over the cellular on the board. Isn't that fantastic? And we get a message back saying unhandled because the board doesn't know how to do anything with that. Now what it should know how to deal with is a reset command. So similarly, if I send that, that will arrive down on the board. And when it arrives down on the board, the board will say, oh yeah, okay, well I need to, uh, I need to do, I need to do a reset. It's interesting that it's taking so long to do that. There you go, took a little while, but it got there in the end. So we've got a reset command here, and the board is duly resetting itself. And what you see is it goes through the network acquisition, GPRS, data connectivity, off we go. Um, and I think that's what I wanted to show you. So this gets us now from early beginnings, installing platform IO, getting some code, connecting in ESP based board, running some data communications over cellular and using the MQTT protocol to move data backwards and forwards. And with that kind of platform underneath you, you can now start to do all sorts of interesting sort of application domain specific things um, using that, that sort of IoT connectivity. So hopefully um, that's of interest and um, I wish you luck with all of your IoT endeavors.